to see all the smiling faces, and uh, it's great to have uh, so many non-Chinese faces uh, in the auditorium, and uh, this is a really great, great uh, uh, event that we're having. Uh, so let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Xu Bing, and I'm a professor uh, of economics and finance at uh, uh, CIBS. And uh, today, uh, we are very honored you know, to uh, have uh, uh, Professor uh, Rami uh, to join us. And uh, I have seen Professor Rami you know, doing many events for the school uh, in the past uh, few days. You know. Uh, that uh, makes me feel better because uh, uh, all professors who are overworking uh, CRBS and uh, we have the distinguished professor uh, uh, Pascal Rami and uh, he has been treated the same way as uh, uh, us, you know, undistinguished professors. Okay? Uh, uh, I don't think we need to have a long introduction of uh, uh, Professor Rami but uh, uh, just uh, a few minutes ago uh, uh, when we were uh, resting, uh, preparing for coming to the auditorium, I learned for the first time uh, that uh, back in 1986, you know, Professor Rami, the, the younger version, 37 uh, years ago, uh, was the chief of staff for the European uh, Commissioner. And they uh, uh, came to Beijing and uh, met uh, Deng Xiaoping. Okay, and it was in this uh, conversation between the head of the European Union and the uh, uh, head of China uh, uh, that uh, actually uh, ha have the, had this uh, idea of uh, establishing a joint venture between Europe and China in business education. Okay. So uh, I think uh, this really, and I have been in this school for about 20 years, uh, I have not learned this important uh, uh, you know, uh, thing, and uh, I think uh, Professor Lamy has been very low-key, and, uh, and I, 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 he showed me a, phone, a photo in his phone, where, which uh, you know, is the, uh, Deng Xiaoping and the, the, the European Commissioner, and, and uh, the younger uh, version of uh, Professor Rami, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, with uh, with black hair, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I have uh, took uh, I I took the opportunity and get the photo of that, and uh, I think more and more people in CIBS will see that photo just right after this uh, this event. Okay, so uh, I, I I would not uh, take too much time here uh, to. Uh, introduce, uh, you know, uh, Professor Rami, and uh, he will give a keynote speech later on. Uh, uh, at that time, I will give a little bit more detailed uh, introduction of his uh, very rich, you know, uh, CV. For now, uh, let's uh, actually welcome our president of CIBS and the Hangian Group Chair in Management, Professor Wang Hong, to give a welcome speech. Professor Wang Hong. Thank you, moderator of today's event, Professor Xu Bing, for inviting me to today's event. Distinguished Professor Lamy, Vice President Frank Bocnoir, Distinguished Professor Xu Bing, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to today's CEIBS Outlook series. Today, as Professor Xu Bing said, it's a great pleasure to have with us the former DG of the World Trade Organization, the Vice President of Paris Peace Forum, coordinator of Jacques Delors Think Tank and a former EU Commissioner for Trade. He's also an old friend of CEIBS, a distinguished professor of CEIBS, Professor Lamy. He will deliver a keynote speech on what's next for globalization, which will be followed by a dialogue between Professor Lamy and Professor Xu Bing. During our meeting with Professor Lamy yesterday, we talked about the past the present and the future of CEIBS. He shared with us 
much encouragement and inspiring insights. He also showed us a very important photo, as Professor Xu Bing alluded to. The photo taken in 1986 at the meeting between the European Commission delegation and Deng Xiaoping, the architect of China's reform and opening up. During that meeting, the idea of CIBS was created. Please join me in giving a big round of applause to Professor Lamy. Of course, Professor Lamy and also Professor Xu Bing are going to talk about many important topics. Professor Lamy is going to share his insights and some of the solutions to today's problems. And also, the two professors are going to share their insights on the latest changes in today's globalization. We have seen that the global value chain production chain have undergone profound changes against this backdrop. How can we promote global trade? How can we further implement the strategy of global integration? 22 years ago, on December the 11th, China acceded to the World Trade Organization, starting its integration with the world economy. The president of the World Economic Forum, Mr. Borger Brenda, once stated that China's accession to the World Trade Organization has been an important step forward for China's economic development and is of great importance to globalization. Now, 22 years have passed. Today, China contributes nearly 30% to the annual world economic growth. China's GDP accounts for more than 18% of the world total. And amid global integration, China managed to make a huge leap forward in its own de economic development. The size of China's GDP increased from the world's number six to the world's number two. Professor Lamy has directly participated in the long negotiations leading to China's accession to the World Trade Organization. That's why during our meeting yesterday, Professor Lamy also mentioned that Madam Wu Yi, Mr. Chen Deming, former minister of MOFCOM and the then vice premier of China have all been his friends for many years. In addition, Professor Lamy has a long history with CIBS. Years ago, when he was working at the European Commission, he witnessed the birth of CEIBS. Since 2018, he has become a distinguished professor of CEIBS, witnessing the success story of CEIBS amid globalization. After 29 years of development, CEIBS has become a world's leading business school. Our global EMBA program ranks the world's number two for four consecutive years. Our MBA program, before the pandemic, already ranked the world's number five for many consecutive years. It is also now China's and Asia's number one. Among all the business schools in China, we have been a front runner, a pioneer. And I'm really grateful for the strong support of our professors, including Professor Lamy. The world economic order has undergone huge changes since the 1980s. Nevertheless, countries and regions have been seeking common development in an interdependent and interconnected way. Over the past period, we have seen many changes, including the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the rise of trade unilateralism, sluggish world economic recovery, regional conflicts, and exacerbating global issues. As a result, we are seeing increasing deficits regarding peace, development, security, and governance. How, against this, against this context, can we develop a more inclusive governance system to address so many daunting challenges that we currently face? I can't wait for the keynote speech to be delivered by Professor Lamy. And from the perspective of CEIBS, in terms of research, we have been doing a lot of work on some important fields. First, regarding the topic of China and the world. Of the 120 full-time professors of CEIBS, 30% already participating in the research of China and the world. And second, on the topic of AI and corporate management, there are currently 20 or so CEIBS professors conducting relevant research. Of course, there is the HAMBA program focusing on modern service sector, which can be further classified into consumption-oriented and production-oriented services. Given the rapid development of the digital economy, more resources are being reallocated to the upstream of the value chain. 
this is also a key research field for CEIBS. How do we pursue greater success of CEIBS and continue to contribute our strength to wisdom to world economic growth? This is also a very important research field for us. So with so many challenges that we face, so many questions unanswered, Professor Lamy is going to share many of his wisdom and insights on these important topics. CIBS is a platform that connects China and the world. We bring together alumni, students, and guests from across the world to share their wisdom and insights. Therefore, for Professor Lamy, as busy as he is to visit our Beijing campus and Shanghai campus and to share his insights on the future, on globalization, on trade integration, and many other important topics, we are deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you. Before I conclude, I would like to wish today's event a great success and also wish you to benefit from today's event. I also want to thank Cadillac for sponsoring today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Wang. And uh, uh, I have to uh, give uh, great praise for our uh, leader. Uh, and uh, when uh, after President Wang you know, joined the school to lead the school, the school has maintained uh, its goal of uh, internationalization and uh, achieving for excellence. And, and uh, I think uh, it is uh, uh, for those who, who, who like uh, CIBS, I can assure you that uh, CIBS is uh, in, in good hands okay, of uh, moving uh, uh, towards the future. So now it's my great honor to uh, uh, introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor uh, Pascal Lamy. As we all know that uh, Professor Pascal Lamy served as the Director General of the World Trade Organization for quite a long time, and uh, under his leadership, uh, we really experienced the best, uh, you know, the peak of globalization. And uh, he also served as vice president of the Paris Peace Forum, the coordinator of the Young Delors Institute. Okay, Young Delors was the uh, uh, commissioner, you know, chairman uh, uh, who met Deng Xiaoping back in uh, 1986 when uh, our uh, dear uh, Professor Lamy was, you know, the, the chief of staff. And then, uh, uh, Professor Lamy is also the uh, former uh, EU commissioner for, for international trade. Right? And uh, the most uh, uh, important one that I leave it to the last, Professor Lamy is currently serve, serving as a distinguished professor at the CEIBS. And I took a look uh, by, by finding his uh, resume uh, posted uh, in uh, China Daily. And uh, that uh, title is clearly uh, there, uh, uh, together with all these distinguished uh, titles. And so we are, we are very happy, we are very honored, and the school is uh, really uh, uh, added a, a lot more value by having uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Professor uh, Pascal Lamy, and uh, he will share his uh, insights about uh, uh, what's going to happen uh, uh, towards the future and uh, what he's reading about uh, the current uh, world uh, economy, uh, the global uh, uh, relationship. And, and uh, uh, so without uh, further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Lamy to the stage. Dear yeah, uh, Madam uh, President uh, Wong, uh, fellow professors, uh, alumni of CIBS, students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, many thanks to my colleague, uh, Professor Xu, uh, for reminding us that uh, the Chinese people 
work more than the European people. <laughs> and that, as a consequence of that, uh, I have to work more as a professor at CABS than I would have at uh, its equivalent uh, in Europe. And after all, listening to uh, Professor Shu, uh, I thought that my speech could be one sentence. What's next for globalization? The answer would be work like the Chinese. <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> so it would be the first time CIBS would have a lecture with only one sentence. <laughs> now, I'm not going uh, to do that because they probably would believe that's a cheap way of not working really too much. Uh, I will be more serious about uh, our topic this afternoon, which is a very complex one uh, to deal with in such a short time, but that's the rule of the game. What about the future globalization? Uh, and I will address uh, this issue in two basic stages. Uh, one, uh, which is looking at the changing winds of globalization as if it were a sort of a ship, a boat, sailing. And the uh, second stage would be uh, what should we do in those circumstances. Now, starting uh, with uh, what I would call the changing winds of globalization, uh, let me very sketchily uh, define what I mean by globalization. By globalization, I mean a process of uh, multi-localization of uh, production systems, goods, services, uh, what uh, economists have called uh, trade in tasks, instead of trading goods or services, bits and parts of goods and services, uh, a process uh, that is uh, globally efficient, if you look at the benefits of globalization, they are positive overall. But they also uh, may be, and often are, uh, painful for some. According to the theory of uh, international exchange, uh, as it was uh, built by uh, people like Mr. Ricardo or Mr. Schumpeter, the starting point is very simple. If you do something better than I do, and if I do something better than you do, we both have a rational interest in exchanging. I will benefit from your know-how. You will benefit from my know-how. This is a win-win. That's the good side of the equation, and I think it is absolutely true that overall such a process leads uh, to uh, more efficiency, hence more growth and uh, more social welfare under a number of conditions. But of course we should not forget the Schumpeter part of the equation, which is the people who in your constituency uh, do things less well than I do and the other way around, will not be happy. They will legitimately have a problem because they'll have to change or leave their job or leave the place where they live uh, to do something different uh, which they believe uh, will be building another comparative advantage where they will do something better than my people. So that's very simply uh, summarized what globalization is about efficient and sometimes painful. What I think uh, we are witnessing at this moment 
is a change in uh, the shaping factors of globalization, uh, which I call uh, with a bit of a poetry uh, the winds of globalization. Let's look at the shaping factors of the previous phase of globalization, let's say the one uh, between the, the mid 80s of the last century and let's say the 10 to 15 first years of our century. There were three major shaping factors, three engines of globalization, three winds uh, that were blowing, technology, ideology, and uh, peace. Technology, because it continuously, like in previous episodes in human history, reduced the cost of distance. And the main obstacle to trade, exchange, globalization, uh, has always been the cost of distance. This cost of distance changes each time a technological jump appears in modes of transport, and we've had quite a lot of that since the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, starting, for instance, with uh, containerization. The guy that invented container, that is the notion that it was more efficient to transport goods in boxes rather than in bulk, did a big revolution in the technology of transport and globalization. Same probably by a guy who was less well known and whose name was Sedo, an American, who invented the rolling luggage, not rocket science. But the moment old people became travelers because they could easily travel in carrying a rolling luggage, totally changed globalization. I worked with a world tourism organization, another WTO, for quite a long time. It was a revolution. So, cost of transport, shrinking, globalization, moving. Second uh, shaping factor, wind, uh, ideology, uh, at a time where uh, openness was a consensus. Opening trade, opening a trade, reducing obstacles to trade, whether tariffs, uh, subsidies, uh, regulations that sometimes uh, favor domestic products over uh, foreign competitors, uh, were progressively reduced with this ideology that reducing obstacles to trade was facilitating this efficient process of circulations of goods and services and people and capital. And the third uh, element is, of course, uh, peace. That period was a period where we had no major threat on a world war. Of course, uh, there were problems here and there. Uh, the invasion of Iraq by the Americans, second one, uh, Afghanistan, Iran had always been a problem during this period, but conflicts were localized, there were not that many, and none of these conflicts seriously engaged any major power. So that's the time where these three winds, technology, ideology, power relationships, pushed globalization in the same way. The three winds were blowing in the same direction. Hence, the formidable expansion of globalization, and uh, Madame uh, President Wong, uh, absolutely right, in saying that on this boat of globalization, the passengers that were the most happy were the Chinese. It coincided with the period where China, after a sort of opening a reform of a 
German uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, realized its most formidable success in economic and social development. Now, these words, these wins, this uh, situation has changed. And it has changed, in my view, uh, not for the better. Starting with peace, in today's world, we have two major conflicts in which major world powers are directly or indirectly engaged. Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia is one of these major world powers. Europe, I'll come back to that, may not yet be a world power, uh, but it is uh, in many respects united. And in invading Ukraine, uh, Russia invaded a European country. We all heard about the attack by Hamas against Israel. The Middle East has always been a region of confrontation, even if indirect, by major powers. Clearly, the US are on the side of Israel, and other major powers are not on the side of Israel. In the case of the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, China is on the side of Russia. China is a major power. US and EU are on the side of Ukraine. This threatened world peace. Now, the only insurance policy we have today against a major deflagration worldwide is nuclear deterrence. That's the only insurance policy which we have left for the moment. I hope it will work, as it has worked, by the way, in several times, uh, but this is not peace. And it has a number of geoeconomic consequences. Ideology, the second wind, has also changed and turned. Not Upside down, not 160 degrees, we would say in the, in the Navy. But the notion that openness is the way to go is now qualified. And it is qualified, unsurprisingly, by the way, given that the first wind has turned, because of an element of security which is penetrating the ideology of internal exchange used to be openness, mostly. It's now quite often security, mostly. It's national security. Uh, the US are uh, handicapping uh, the export of uh, dual-use uh, chips uh, to China. And what, when they do that, they sometimes, on the way, handicap the export of EU chips to China, economic security, many countries have realized, notably during COVID, that some of these supply chains that were spanning the economics of the planet are fragile and need a bit more resilience, social security in some places, notably United States of America, where the social safety net is weak, part of the population has come to believe that globalization is the reason why they lost their job. And in the US, the last part of the narrative is that they lost their job because of China. And of course, uh, environmental security, which is becoming, understandably, a major issue in international exchange. We all know about the catastrophic impact of global warming. We all know we need to decarbonize our economies. We all decided to do it in Paris in 2015. But we also decided we would do it à la carte and not with a menu. So we do it à la carte. And doing it à la carte, we Europeans price carbon. The US don't like pricing carbon, so they subsidize. 
the US don't like us putting a carbon border adjustment, and we don't like the US pumping dollars uh, into uh, their economy uh, in delivering, uh, delivering the competitive playing field. I'm just taking this example. Environmental security leads to trade frictions. It translates into some obstacles to trade which were not there before. And finally, uh, technology, uh, which uh, again in the previous period uh, was uh, blowing in uh, the openness and globalization direction. Technology is now uh, blowing in different directions depending on what you look at. It's blowing in the direction of globalization if you look at the enormous progress of interconnectedness. This world is more and more interconnected every day, every month, every week. This is pushing globalization. Now, there are a few uh, dozens of millions of uh, Indian doctors who will enter the market of uh, medical telediagnosis in the 20 years to come. This is globalization. It's not yet globalized, but it will be globalized. On the other side, on the other side, the digitalization of, of the economy and of society raises issues with globalization uh, because the regulation of digital economy, and I was yesterday uh, in the same place talking about the regulation of AI, is different. If you look at what happened since last uh, July, uh, we had a Chinese law about AI, how to have in China a safe AI system. We had a US executive order in October, how to have in the US a safe AI system. And we had last week a, a bill that was adopted by the European Parliament on an EU AI regulation. Three different regulations. Uh, there's a process looking at this in the G7. There's another process looking at this in the G20. There's another process looking at this in the International Telecommunication Union. There's another process looking at this at the OECD. It's fragmented. This is a problem. In the previous phase, we had a global regulation about safety of planes. Huh? Planes are standard. The safety of planes is standardized exactly the same way in any place of this planet. Of course, we understand why. Huh? Plane is a dangerous thing. We'll have an interest in doing this. They fly everywhere. Pilots come from various nationalities. They need a single standard, and we did it. And we did the same for the diseases of animals. Huh? The definition of a foot and mouth disease for the cow is exactly the same everywhere on this planet. And if there is a problem somewhere, this problem is isolated by the rest of the planet within an organization which deals with the health of animals. So in the previous period, we had safety harmonized in a number of areas. We do not have that in the digital system for a variety of reasons. And I think the fundamental reason behind this is that the safety of a plane is not something that has to do with ideology, with philosophy, with culture, with religion. Maybe the safety of a cow may have to do something with religion in India, but in the rest of the planet, it's quite straightforward. Data is a different ballgame. And this is why we have a threat to globalization in this part of the economy, which of course will become more and more important, as well as in society. So, in a nutshell, winds of change. Overall, the explanation uh, is that whereas during the previous period, geoeconomics would trump geopolitics. In the new situation, uh, geopolitics have regained the upper hand. And some would say the period of globalization where the three winds were blowing together was an exception. We are back to human history with great powers rivalries, 
passions, wars. We thought after the fall of the Berlin Wall, that the world was flat, that this was the end of history, no, 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 we are back to the old world. Now, what should we do? And this is, of course, the more operational part of this uh, conversation. Uh, let me uh, try and outline a few, a few ways forward uh, in order to try and contain these divisive forces and try and make sure that the turbulence of uh, these winds uh, not blowing in the same direction uh, do not result in a tempest that would uh, sink the boat. I want first to say that whereas we have a different globalization shaping, I do not think we will have a deep globalization. I think we will have a slower globalization, what the economists uh, called uh, a few years ago, slobalization. I think we would have a more securitized globalization, what I would call uh, paranobalization, sorry for uh, the acronym. But I don't think overall this will move back. And by the way, if you look at the number, we've never had such a high volume of trade. 2022 was a record. True, if you look at investment flows, some of them have decreased between US and China, between EU and China, not between uh, US and EU, uh, by the way. So, it's a different kind of globalization with more friction and certainly, at the end of the day, less efficiency. The trade-off between security and efficiency has changed. The problem being that this trade-off is with a cost. Somebody will have to pay for the increase of the price of risk. And this somebody, at the end of the day, is the consumer. It's you, me, the population. And overall, this will lead to less growth. Growth is roughly nothing else but uh, the accumulation of new efficiencies. So if you have less new efficiencies, we will have less growth, which is bad. And notably, I think it's not good for peace because part of the problems we have, if you look at Africa, for instance, uh, come from the fact that they don't have enough development, their standard of living is too low, and if this new globalization does not provide the lifting the boat impact of the previous one, this is bad news. What should we do? A uh, few uh, insights or recommendations. Uh, the first one, of course, which goes without saying, is that we should try and reduce geopolitical tensions, which is the main factor that has changed, mostly S-West, mostly between the US and China, and this is a very difficult thing to do, because both US and China now have come to the view that the other is threatening them. China believes it is vulnerable to US possible aggressivity, and US is believing that it's vulnerable to China's eventual possible aggressivity. Not maybe against the US, and the US not maybe against China, but this is the mindset on both sides. It's a, it's a lack of trust. And I think a lack of trust can only be fixed by measures that, little by little, rebuild trust. So that, at the end of the day, the US may be convinced that China is not after them, and that China is convinced that the US is not after them. This will take time. I think the recent uh, meeting uh, between uh, President Xi Jinping and President Biden, who led to a little bit of cross building in avoiding, for instance, military incidents, is a small step. So maybe we need 50 small steps like this one, but I think this is the way to go. But this is not the only area 
where there is now a lot of trust. If I look at the map of the UN votes on uh, sanctions against Russia, or the map of the UN votes on a ceasefire in Gaza, I see a lack of trust between the North and the South. I was a week in COP28 in Dubai before coming here. Quite a lot of people, understandably, on the South, believe that the North is responsible for emitting uh, the carbon dioxide that triggers global warming, and that the North should basically pay the bill, which does make some sense. Of course, uh, easier said than done, because this will lead to very complex rebalancing according uh, to uh, common but differentiated responsibilities as uh, the Paris Agreement uh, coined. But this is an area where we absolutely need to depolarize North South relation. And in my view, the North needs to be more forthcoming in a accelerating uh, emission, uh, in uh, providing more money for adaptation, in moving forward to carbon uh, removal, and maybe, and maybe, and we discussed that in Beijing uh, with a very famous uh, Chinese academic authority who was a member of my Climate Overshoot Commission, Professor Shui Lan, maybe even in looking cautiously at uh, technologies uh, like uh, geoengineering or more precisely solarization modifications. Where we have, I think, to move is to keep trying to build convergence where possible. In the WTO, for instance, we have to try and re recruit the United States of America into the WTO. They left it in de facto in uh, blocking the dispute settlement mechanism. This is something that we definitely should fix in order to recreate the level playing field uh, we had uh, before. Same, for instance, to remain in the World Trade Organization with some sort of a more precise definition of what national security is. There is an exception for national security in the WTO, but this exception is not a blanket waiver. You cannot do anything in the name of national security, which is, for instance, what the US did with Trump when they put a tariff on the EU steel and aluminium, uh, because exporting steel and aluminium from US to, from EU to US was a threat to US national security, uh, which is total not. And also, probably, in looking at this big issue of subsidies, given that most of us now have become a bit more Chinese in using subsidization as a way uh, to promote uh, tech or to develop our businesses. But, for a number of reasons, convergence will probably be less easy than in the past. And if convergence is less easy, I think we should consider Plan B. Plan A is convergence, I think, and should remain convergence. Uh, plan B is uh, coexistence. So we have differences, but we recognize these differences, we try to understand them, and we try to manage these differences in organizing coexistence. Or, if you want to use a more business-like uh, term, organize interoperability between these different systems. And this is what we should do, for instance, in the digital system. Uh, like, for instance, uh, adopting a global AI uh, common risk assessment standard. Uh, why do we have different AI regulation? Because we do not weight the risks in the same way. Well, we should try, at least, to have some sort of understanding with a scale of risk where do we believe AI is not risky at all, and where do we believe AI is very risky, and in the meantime, have a scale that allows us to understand why we have these differences and to narrow them. 
I think it's exactly the same on the environment because of the Paris Agreement. This position that decarbonization is done with nationally determined contributions and not multilateralized determined contributions, like in the WTO. In the WTO, we have multilaterally determined contributions. The way we open trade results from a multilateral discussion, and we all do our way, but as a reciprocity for what others do. In climate, it's not the same at all. Now, in, nobody in the WTO says trade should be open 90% or 60% or 70%. But we have rules of behavior that allow us to behave roughly in the same way. In the climate governance, there is a target, which is great, which is zero carbon, but we have zero norm and zero rule of behavior. So this, in these circumstances, we have there will be no convergence. We have to organize some sort of comparability, leading maybe in the future to some sort of compatibility. And this leads me to my uh, conclusion, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, being at CIBS, uh, is about what should EU and China do, and maybe even better, try to do together. Now, the blank answer is uh, not much uh, because of structural differences that have grown in recent times and which make an EU-China relationship more difficult than in the past for political reasons in the case of the EU and for economic reasons in the case of China. The political reason in the case of the EU is that China does not take the EU very seriously on political grounds. China considers, and this is understandable, that the EU is an economic integration process, but that the real political authority remains with the member states. So China interacts with the EU at two levels, the level of Brussels for economics and the level of member states for politics. This is not conducive to a proper relationship. The reality is that the EU will integrate politically in the future. I do recognize that we are far from being there. But I think China makes a mistake in not looking forward enough about the EU. It's very good at looking forward for itself. But in this case, China should bet on an integrating politically EU rather than not, that would help. But for the moment, it's not the case. And the problem with China, as we all know, at least in Europe, is an economic one, not a political one. It's same from the fact that the structures of the Chinese economy, the macroeconomic management of China, leads systematically to under consumption, over investment, and over capacities. The macroeconomic reason why we have 400 billion deficit is not just trade measures. Of course, if we would fix trade problems on both sides, we might reduce uh, the trade uh, deficit by 50 billion, maybe 100 billion, maybe 150 billion. But the rest is of macroeconomic nature. China has a system which systematically, nowadays, and it was not always the case, there was the case around before 2010, where the Chinese trade surplus uh, went to quasi zero, it's now whoop, gone back a uh, big way. And this is a structural problem uh, which we Europeans cannot fix, it's beyond our reach, but which may be. Uh, Chinese authority uh, should consider. They've done it with the dual circulation theory. To be frank, uh, I don't think it's working very well. To finish, there is one area uh, where I believe uh, EU and China are both ideologically aligned 
and have complementary capacities, which is the environment. Um, if you look at who believes what about what needs to be done uh, to address global warming and to try and clean our environment, EU and China are probably the places on the planet who think the most alike. That's a good start. Huh? We don't have a lot of that in other areas. That's a very good start. We don't have that really well, by the way. Uh, and we don't have that uh, with other parts of the world that are less developed and less industrialized than EU or China. So that would be my sort of, you know, low hanging fruit. We in Europe have a sort of know how in environment regulation, which by the way led China to import our emission trading system, which is great. China has built a formidable comparative advantage in green tech, uh, which uh, we should try and benefit from. Let's exchange EU regulatory capacity against uh, China uh, green tech in some areas. I think that would be a good thing. That would be my sort of short-term proposal. If we together can contain the divisive forces that I have uh, mentioned, uh, let's try and start on a relatively safe ground, which is uh, environment, uh, cleaning, and climate change addressing. And my wish is that, uh, and that's my concluding point, my wish is that uh, if we do that, CIBS uh, could be part of this new adventure. Many thanks for your attention. We have about uh, uh, 40 minutes, and I, I will open to the floor, you know, after our uh, uh, discussion between me and uh, uh, Professor Lamy, okay? So given the short time period, I, I will be a little bit more provocative, okay? Allow me uh, to be, because I'm a professor and uh, my students know that uh, I'm very much pushing them to the, to the limit. I do not dare to push uh, Professor Rami to the limit, but uh, uh, I will be uh, as candidate as uh, you know uh, when I was talking to the students. Okay, I think you mentioned uh, something very interesting that is uh, you know China uh, uh, probably you know uh, did not consider uh, the European Union uh, in the same uh, you know uh, way as the United States. So uh, if uh, we look at uh, you know what has been going on uh, in terms of uh, the global relationship, at least I see one trend that is uh, regionalism. And, and uh, for example, you know China has been uh, making a good effort uh, to establish uh, uh, and push this so-called RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic. Uh, Partnership and the, the 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 15 countries signed this deal uh, in late 2020. And uh, recently, the United States uh, has been uh, uh, initiating the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for uh, Prosperity (IPEF). If we look at uh, ASEP, it's uh, 15 countries. If we look at uh, IPEF, it's 14 countries. But actually, there are 11 countries overlapping. Uh, but uh, uh, clearly, you know, the IPEF uh, was considered by the United States uh, to be an uh, important uh, regional uh, uh, organization, uh, you know, to contain uh, uh, China or you know, at least to, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, deal with a lot of things that, uh, you know, is in the related to China. Uh, on the other hand, RCEP is also, you know, uh, an initiative of China, you know, try to build the relationships with its neighbors and also with some of the uh, developed countries like, uh, you know, Australia and, uh, and New Zealand. So, uh, so I wonder, you know, this uh, trend, uh, as I was saying, you know, seems to first, uh, you know, uh, there is this very clear, what I actually in my class calls 
uh, one globe uh, two systems. Right? Uh, second, uh, it does not really take uh, very seriously, as using your word, uh, the European Union in this uh, uh, reshaping of the world uh, economic order. So uh, I would like to, to hear Professor Lamy's comments uh, on this uh, development, and uh, is it part of what do you think as the globalization uh, for the future, or uh, uh, a new kind of globalization for the future, or actually you think it's uh, uh, detrimental you know, to uh, what you propose as the multilateralism-based uh, globalization? Well, I will answer in uh, two points. First, I've never believed, nor do I believe now, that bilateral or regional trade opening runs against multilateral trade opening. I know that some academics, like uh, Yagdish Bhagwati, for instance, have written pages and pages about the fact that bilateral agreement and these preferences that countries give to each other are distorting trade, and no, I don't believe that. I'm, I've often said that. I believe in the Chinese uh, proverb uh, that says that uh, don't mind the color of the cat, provided it catches mice. If a trade agreement catches obstacle to trade, whatever the color, regional, bilateral, multilateral, good for me. So this is not the problem. But what I also believe is that economic integration today is much less than in the past about tariffs and much more than in the past about regulation. The average worldwide weighted tariff today is 5%. The average cost, which most companies in a large bunch of businesses have to engage to make sure that their product or their service matches the regulatory standard of the country they want to export, is 20%. So on average, regulatory obstacles to opening trade are four times bigger than traditional systems. And this is why RCEP, in my view, is a good agreement, but it's a shallow agreement. It's not a deep agreement. If you like to see, for instance, what ASEAN countries are trying to do together, they try to go much deeper in adopting, if not harmonized, at least compatible or mutually recognized uh, regulatory systems. So, the issue is with regulation. And this is why uh, the uh, IPEF, in my view, uh, is like a theater backstage. Huh? If you kick it, it goes down. It's not solid. It's something nice. But the US will not, for the times to come, engage in even a tariff negotiation to build this IPEF. So for the moment, it's hot air. It's, it's, it's nicely done. You can put people around the table and have a good conversation about how to contain China. Uh, you can have a group photo that uh, the media uh, will reproduce. And it will look like something serious, but it's not some, for me, it's not something serious. Integration today necessitates to go to the level of regulation, safety, precaution, environment, health, accounting, dredging, the whole, the whole series of issues which are now more and more driven, I would say, by precaution as much as by protection, which is why I... I think it's now precautionism that's driving this obstacle to trade, the reduction of which is much more difficult. If, if I exchange 
my uh, tariff on scrap metal against your tariff on bicycle, we have no ideological differences. Huh? Scrap metal is scrap metal everywhere. Bicycles are bicycles everywhere. Uh, we might spend the night saying, I will give you 5% because I will sell these bicycles and you will give me 3.5%. But no, that's not, that's not a difficult negotiation. Globalization needs us to go to difficult negotiations. And this difficulty is now bigger than in the past because of these turbulences. Okay, uh, allow me as a professor to summarize what uh, Professor Rami said. Okay, and uh, Professor Rami was very clear about uh, uh, you know uh, what kind of globalization uh, he uh, uh, considers to be valuable towards the future. And as we probably all know that uh, in the past uh, uh, 30, 40 years in the 21st century, uh, the WTO and the predecessor, you know, GATT, uh, was very successful in, you know, through multilateral negotiations to reduce the tariff all the way to 5% for the world. But, but, uh, uh, it's clear that, uh, you know, there's not, uh, uh, much room and much value to push this tariff even further. And in terms of, uh, the, uh, regional, uh, agreement like, uh, China's, uh, you know, promoted, uh, RCEP, uh, if I remember correctly, it uh, says 90%, you know, uh, free trade, you know, it's basically tariff. So, so tariffs, according to, uh, Professor Rami, uh, not the, 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 the key for, for future globalization. The key is, uh, about, uh, regulations. Okay. And, uh, for example, we have this, uh, you know, COP, uh, you know, uh, conference and, uh, f with regard to climate change and so on. Yeah. Uh, so that's that it said, you know, uh, let me come back to this traditional, uh, uh more traditional, uh, uh, argument, uh, in, 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 in time relation. For example, uh, the European uh, Union leaders just, uh, uh, you know, came to China uh, to have a conversation. And uh, it seemed that uh, one of the things that they were pushing is uh, that uh, the argument was that China was running too much uh, uh, surplus with regard to uh, the European Union. Uh, and uh, uh, the Chinese response was that, you know, first, you know, uh, we, we, we export more like uh, electronic vehicle battery because we have more better technology. Uh, that's the technology. Uh, that's not that uh, we give subsidy, uh, you know, and even without the subsidy, we would be able to sell that much, uh, you know, in Europe. Uh, secondly, China was saying that we like uh, to reduce the trade uh, 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 surplus with you and your trade deficit with us, uh, but uh, that you would, uh, you should allow us to buy the certain technologies. And, uh, and, uh, so, so this kind of argument, you know, do you think it, uh, uh, you know, you, uh, how far it goes and with regard to, uh, the, the, a healthy, you know, uh, argument for globalization, you know, uh, as this kind of so-called traditional argument are still very much there. It's, uh, it's uh, basically, uh, you know, this mercantilism, right? Uh, you know, sur surplus is good uh, and the deficit is bad and we need to first uh, get this thought out. Afterwards, we, 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 we cooperate with each other. Okay. This takes back to, the point I made about the uh, US-China trade deficit. 400 billion deficit is not a trade issue. There are trade elements in this. It may be that there are some export restrictions of weaponry, chips, or stuff that we don't export to China. Okay. How much is that? Well, Three billion? Five billion? Nothing to do with 400 billion. So the problem with the Chinese trade deficit is that it is structural. It is not trade. It's just that given the size of the state in the Chinese economy, and the part of the Chinese economy which is under command, which is the state-owned sector, which has grown quite rapidly since 2010, then a part of your production system is not market-driven. It's 
centrally driven, and it leads to over product production. Given that your consumption is subdued, because your saving rate is too high, you overproduce, and where do you sell what you overproduce? Abroad. And this is a structural issue that needs to be addressed. And, and we cannot address it uh, among trade negotiators. No? It's something that is, is a fundamental problem. I believe, long term, this is not the way to go. And by the way, the state-owned sector had shrunk to roughly 10% of the economy before 2010. And it's now back to, what, 20 25%? And if you do the correlation between how much China has of command economy and its trade surplus, you will find an interesting correlation. I mean, all correlations are not uh, causalities. So I think this, 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 is the real, this is the real issue. And it's exactly the same as why do the U.S. have a structural trade deficit not because of trade. I mean, Trump was totally wrong in believing that putting tariff on Chinese stuff would change the U.S. trade deficit. The reason why you have a trade deficit is because they don't save enough, they consume too much, they simply can print dollar the way they want and finance their trade deficit, which other countries would not do, because at some stage, the amount you have to borrow to finance your trade deficit would be a draw uh, on uh, on your rating, but they don't have this problem because they have the dollar. So this is structural. Now on EVs, uh, I think China uh, has a point. China has succeeded extremely well, and this is very impressive in producing, let's say, price to quality extremely good EVs. Well, it's not the top of the market, but it's it's a very, very solid product for sort of middle range market. It produces much more EVs than it can consume because lots of provinces and industries have invented, uh, have invested in EVs. So there's a lot of that everywhere, which, by the way, has been subsidized by provinces, which, as you know, don't always uh, follow the directives of uh, Beijing in some areas, and notably subsidization or borrowing. The problem being that the U.S. market is closed since Trump. The Japanese market is closed, and it's never been very open for cars, by the way. And in the European region, the Turkish market, which is a rather deep one now, is closed because of tariffs. So the only open market to Chinese overproduction of EVs is EU. This is not sustainable. For a variety of reasons, it's not sustainable. People in the EU have, I mean, the EU industry has started moving uh, EV. They've done it less quickly than China because they had to adjust all the production system uh, to uh, battery-powered uh, vehicles. And as you know, uh, it, it totally changes the way you produce a car. Huh? It's not just something you change. It totally changes the concept of what a car is and how it works. For the moment, they are moving up, and uh, I think, in the right direction. But much less, uh, much slowly than China. And in the meantime, there is a big problem. And I think one has to understand that the EU has a problem as long as the other markets remain closed. Okay, uh, let me again summarize what uh, uh, Professor Lamy said. Professor Lamy said very clearly that uh, the trade uh, imbalance you know, between China and the EU and China and the United States it is structural, you know. As I was teaching my dear MBA students uh, one week ago, they just finished the, the, that uh, exam. This is the difference between uh, saving and investment, which determines the overall trade uh, balance. Uh, so, uh, what uh, uh, Professor Rabi says is that uh, 
uh, you know, uh, China's uh, 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 characteristic of uh, extremely high saving, right? And uh, it is probably behind the, this imbalance uh, within the Chinese economy is, is, is more responsible for China's huge, uh, you know, trade surplus with other countries. The same thing can be said about the United States and the U.S. Uh, you know, is having a habit of uh, less, uh, lower saving and uh, high consumption. So that uh, uh, contributes the most to U.S. Uh, trade uh, surplus. And he mentioned the Trump's political uh, argument, uh, uh, which uh, totally was not uh, economics uh, economics based. Okay, by the way, you know, we don't know whether Trump would be come back next year or, or not, right? And uh, so that's that. Uh, let's see. But uh, he's a smart politician, although he he probably. Uh, you know, uh, have, have no, no basis economically speaking. The second uh, thing, if I understand the correctly uh, about uh, Professor uh, Rami, is that uh, uh, China, in terms of its uh, economic system, you know, is uh, quite different from other countries. And uh, we do have uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, government, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of strategy, right? Uh, targeting certain industries. Although all countries do that, but China has been doing it, uh, uh, you know, more uh, systematically and, uh, you know, uh, more intensively. And uh, so, so that uh, would, uh, uh, you know, in, in Professor Rami's way, you know, there's only one major uh, market that uh, the Chinese uh, uh, EV and uh, battery uh, would penetrate. Uh, that's the European Union, and uh, that uh, cannot be uh, lasting forever. Right? I mean, and that that, uh, that would cause problems. And, and uh, I think uh, this is a good a good point that uh, I, I, all countries should really you know uh, understand each other uh, uh, to to promote. But uh, you know, uh, uh, compare with like a, a negotiation in many countries, uh, we, we you know successfully closing a round to uh, uh, you know. Uh, Reduce tariffs simultaneously, but but it's now you say regulations are the most important uh, thing. But uh, how is it possible uh, for uh, uh, multilateralism to be applied uh, for these uh, regulations? Because we are in a different world. So if if the argument is such that uh, for the world of a tariff cut. A multilateral uh, works, and so uh, this WTO and its uh, uh, you know what WTO promotes is is, is fitting uh, for the 20th century. Isn't it true that uh, the same argument can go like uh, if regulations are now the basis for uh, 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 you know global relationship, and uh, this is very difficult uh, to be negotiated, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the multilateral platform. And does that mean that uh, the, the law of WTO or, or, or the, the same kind, the, 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 the multilateralism based uh, internal organization, their law would be diminishing, you know, in the 21st century? Well, you're absolutely right. Insofar as obstacles to trade are now more stemming from discrepancies in regulations than in tariffs, they are more difficult to address. I totally agree with that. Which does not mean that it is impossible, but it is more difficult, not least because if I remove my tariffs on your bicycle, my lots of consumers in my constituency will be very happy and a few bicycle producers will scream. But there are not many. And for my domestic politics balance, I'll be supported by a lot of consumers, and I will have a problem with a few bicycle producers. A good politician can do that. If it's about changing my regulation, because I have to make my regulation nearer to yours or more compatible with yours, that's much more difficult. Huh? A lot of people in my constituency will say, hey, we thought we were sovereigns. Who are these people who are telling us how to do this or this or take this level of precaution or that level of precaution? So politically, it's much more difficult. Huh? You need proximities in, again, most of these regulations are about risk. 
management. Back to the point that risk appreciation is a scale between good and bad. So this indeed, this indeed is difficult, but a, at least what you can do is narrow these discrepancies. And by the way, this is what WTO does. There was an agreement, not between all members of WTO, but between a large number, recently, on how to, I mean, what is the precautions you need to take if you establish a new domestic regulation so that it does not systematically hurt the others. And there are methodologies to do that. You can notify, you can have a sort of a, a public interest registers, uh, you can have a, uh, consultations. So. But I, I do recognize that it is uh, more difficult, but I also think that this is the real name of integration today. And by the way, we know this, we Europeans. Huh? I was the chief of staff of uh, Jacques Delors, as you said, not only when uh, we met uh, Chairman Deng in uh, 86, but when we did the internal market, which got rid of internal borders within the EU in 1992, we did not get rid of internal borders because we had zero tariff. We had zero tariff from the beginning, huh? 1954 on, that was 1992. During all these years, we had borders with zero tariff, but we had borders because our regulations on the safety net, uh, on the safety of cars, or on the quality of milk, or on the way to produce beer, were different. And these compatibilities between the regulation next door and my regulation was checked at the border. We moved from 85 to 92, that was seven years, to a system where either our regulations were harmonized, and they were harmonized in a number of areas, and this was a technically complex process, or we came to the conclusion that we should recognize the other's regulation. After all, if the Belgians drink German beer, German beer, which is good for the Germans, can be as good for the Belgians and the other way around. Instead of having a problem uh, with German beer not being produced the same way as Belgian beer. So there are ways to do that. Now, we did it. Of course, within the European Union, with neighbors, with, uh, I mean, uh, geographical and cultural proximity. Uh, but there are ways to do that, even if it does not always lead to leveling the playing field. And I said in my remarks, we did it for planes. And was it easy to do it for planes? No, it wasn't easy. I mean, the Americans had their own view of what, uh, what the safety of planes were. We had our own view of what the safety of planes were. Well, we discussed, we came. And, and the pressure of plane producers and of plane pilots and of air passengers who wanted to take planes led to this result. So I think we have, we have to go back to example of this kind to understand how it worked. And the truth is that markets played a big role in achieving this because they are rational. Economies of scale mean a lot of things. In the way globalization led to efficiencies, economies of scale played a big role. And I think we have to go back to these, uh, to these uh, basics. Now, I remember when I was EU Trade Commissioner, we wanted, together with the US, my US counterpart, Bob Zolik, to push this common regulatory agenda forward. And we thought that our systems were not doing it enough. So we decided that we would handle ourselves, both of us, one example to show that it was possible. And the example we took was safety equipment for leisure boats. The fashion in Europe is to have US yachts. The fashion in US is to have EU yachts. Ha <laughs> ha, that's great, complimentary. Ah, no, there was no real trade because the safety equipments 
were different. So if you bought your European a US yacht, you had to refit the whole safety equipment and the other way around. And that was a cost. So we decided we should harmonize the safety equipment and then, but we had forgotten that the color of a rocket, an emergency rocket, which is red for you and me, for serious regulators is not red. It's a, it's a spectrum of color frequencies. And the American red was a certain frequency and the European red was another frequency. And so the question was, ah, should the common frequency be the total of the two or only the part of the two that were the same? It took six years for regulators to come to an agreement on this issue of the precise definition of the color frequency of safety rockets. So I'm taking this example. I mean, that's, that's not, again, that's not ideological. Huh? It's not cultural. It's not philosophical. It's just that it's complex. So we have to recognize that these things are the ones we have to deal with. I know it's not, not very uh, enthusiastic, huh? it's, uh, but that's, that's how it works. Uh, I posed uh, quite a difficult question to Professor Rami. I say that, uh, you know, now with regard to, you know, uh, these regulations, how could we uh, you know, do it, uh, uh, you know, uh, the same way as uh, we did you know, with regard to his very transparent uh, tariff rates? And uh, Professor Rami went uh, very extensively uh, to the experience of the European Union and uh, some examples, uh, uh, you know, between uh, Europe and and uh, and, uh, and the United States. The point is that uh, you do not uh, seek immediately quick uh, fix. The point is that if there is this win-win room, you know, uh, uh, maybe it takes six years, but uh, still, you know, uh, you you move to that direction. And that that uh, really is very inspiring, you know. And he was also, I think uh, this was uh, to the younger generation. You, know? you look at uh, certain uh, very difficult uh, things in the past and figure out uh, how those things are done. For example, uh, it went to my mind that uh, when it's in the Cold War, when China, uh, the Soviet Union, and the United States were, were enemies and so on, you know, how could China be able to, right? I mean, uh, welcome Nixon and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, rebuild the relationship, uh, change the world. And uh, similarly, you know, uh, when Deng Xiaoping was trying to uh, do this uh, reform opening, you know, uh, now we think it's taken for granted, but it's difficult, right? I mean, but uh, uh, given that it's difficult, uh, we do not do it. I think uh, the past, uh, you know, Successful examples, uh, uh, you know, deserve a careful study so that uh, we figure out uh, certain tricks, you know, why, you know, it was uh, so more difficult uh, at that time, but uh, still it uh, uh, worked well, you know, in terms of the final solution. And uh, now we face uh, these uh, challenging, you know, situations, regulations, uh, AI, you know, climate change. Uh, and and then we just say you know we lie flat and uh, we do not deal with them. Uh, but that's not the the attitude that uh, Professor Rami is proposing. Okay, uh, I will have uh, a couple of questions. Then uh, I will open to the floor. Okay, uh, in your speech you mentioned the two phases of globalization. On the one hand, uh, it is. Uh, uh, Argued by uh, many economists, and uh, maybe it's also true. Uh, it's good, of, uh, you know, of overall because of it, it improves efficiency. Right. On the other hand, uh, you know, you cite the Schumpeter, but it's uh, the Stoppel Samuelson theorem, whatever. Right. It's that it, uh, the, the 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 more you know uh, global integration will always lead uh, some people to be the winners and some to be the losers. Uh, and uh, uh, the same actually applies to technology. Uh, imagine that in the future, uh, we human beings were replaced uh, by, by the AI. And so the AI, uh, you know, adoption would uh, raise the efficiency, but it would uh, make certain people winners, and, but many people losers. Uh, so these uh, two phases of globalization or technological change uh, have always been in the literature. But uh, 
don't you think, uh, Professor Rami, that uh, the ugly face of this globalization or technological change is now uh, more significantly, at least perceived, to be more significant uh, in in today's world, right? And if that's the case, and for those of us who like free trade, who like uh, you know uh, this market, uh, you know uh, allocation, don't we have some soul searching? To do right in terms of why you know uh, so many people do not like them. Well, I think that goes to the depths of the problem that protectionism is easier to deal with than precautionism. Protectionism is when you protect your people from foreign competition tariffs. Easy. Precautionism is when you protect your people from risks. And we do that differently. Hence, frictions for trade, which we need to address, and addressing these frictions is more difficult. In the case of protectionism, as I said, it's a problem of constituency managing. Lots of winners, a few losers, Again, a good politician can deal with that. In the case of risk management, it's much more complex. The level of uh, explaining, uh, pedagogy, and sometimes it's complex, is much more, much more difficult. But we also could think, and I hope that this is what will happen with AI, we also could think that in a totally new venture, which we have to regulate because there are risks, but we, in a way, more easily try to do it together rather than each on our own. And I think on, on AI, I'm sure that for certain ideological or political reasons, there will remain differences, but could, we could at least try to limit these differences. Hence, this notion, for instance, of a, a common standard. And in the case of AI, it's you know AI has pluses and minuses. But if the, if there is a real risk in AI for losing human agency on machines. This is not a risk for a few people who will be unhappy. <laughs> it's, it's a risk for us all. It's, it's, it's a general problem. It's not something that will hurt just or be a problem for a few people. It's going to be a big problem for a lot of people. So it's, this is where I think it's in this, it is in this direction which uh, we need to look in, for the future, not in the past. For the years to come, the winds I have uh, sketchily, sketchily described will keep blowing in different and turbulent reactions. So we will have to hard time navigating this. I don't see any good reason for this to change. We simply have, I think, to direct our eyes to where we have a chance of limiting, containing the consequences of these differences, some of them being of a political or geopolitical nature, like the invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, by uh, Mr. Putin, others being more of a geoeconomic or scientific or geoeconomic nature, which where rationality can deploy uh, its benefits, whereas in geopolitics it's more about passions. My last question, okay, since uh, our uh, President Wang is here, our Dean uh, Frank is here, so uh, it's a rare opportunity for me, you know, to ask uh, our uh, wise man, you know, uh, this question. Uh, the, 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 the 
issues we talked about, uh, you know, the ugly face of this globalization and the ugly face of this technology change, uh, if it appears, uh, uh, maybe it's more likely, you know, for the younger generation than for, for us. And so uh, what would you think uh, that uh, the in the curriculum of the MBA education for a school like CEIBS, uh, uh, in your, you know, understanding, uh, what uh, uh, kind of things we should uh, emphasize more. Uh, I, I think in the past, uh, we emphasized more on uh, raising the management skill and uh, to make a profit uh, uh, to the, for the company, which is more efficiency based. Of course, we now say more about uh, ESG, social responsibility, but uh, there, there still seems to be uh, something that, uh, that we should value more. And, uh, you know, uh, what would you say that, uh, uh business schools, uh, in the next 10, 20 years and, uh, the, the, the focus and, and, uh, what we should really, uh, value? Well, first, I agree that in business, and I still work a lot with uh, business, ESG, at least the environmental climate slash biodiversity will matter more and more. There are various levers to do that. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, the only way to do that properly is to price properly environmental externalities, whether on a uh, carbon emissions or on uh, biodiversity uh, degradation. Uh, and I think the only question is how fast do we go? Uh, I have been chairing for the last two years uh, a climate overshoot commission with a lot of uh, old monkeys and uh, luminaries of my kind. Uh, and uh, those of you uh, who are interested, we will discuss this uh, tomorrow about how could we avoid overshooting the 1.5? And there is a series of things we should do and others we should not do. So this is inevitable because it's a matter of life and death for the planet. So that's the first thing. I think in learning and teaching business, this element has to grow. And by the way, we... Uh, discussed uh, yesterday with uh, Frank, who uh, president, how could I, for instance, create some sort of bridge uh, between uh, what we, the think tanks that work on this in Europe and CIBS. Second element, I think, and this is, in my view, the main explanation of the success of uh, CIBS uh, so far, is that you created, it was called China Europe, which was something very weird in a way. It was not a Chinese one, it was not a European one, it was a China Europe. It's, if you look at the number of people uh, who uh, got a diploma from CIBS, uh, the vast majority are Chinese. But why did it succeed? It succeeded because you mingled the two. Huh? You, the reputation of CIBS, you, you got it right in the, in the motto of the school. Huh? It's both China depth and the width of global systems. So my, my advice is, although there may be political forces uh, pushing in another direction, and I can understand that and sometimes see that, keep, keep this comparative advantage, which is bringing faculty, students, uh, whatever the level, with different nationalities that bring this sort of notion that if you have a CIBS diploma, you're okay in China and you're okay elsewhere in the world. I think this, this has created the attractiveness for Chinese students because they have a sort of a passport that they can do business uh, elsewhere. 
and this is pretty attractive. Notably, if you overproduce and you need to sell abroad, by the way, it's a good way of making sure that <laughs> a number of people will be thinking about this. But it also attracts non-Chinese students because they know that they will be, if not totally acquainted, but they will get a sense of how China works. And if I'm 15 years old, 20 years old, 25 years old, I mean, for my grandchildren, for instance, they know that much better than I did at their age that China is going to be important. So my, my advice is keep as much as possible this synergy uh, which uh, you have uh, created. Let's give a round of applause uh, uh, for that advice, okay? Uh, on a personal note, uh, I'm very happy that uh, the hypothesis I, I proposed, uh, what's next for globalization? Uh, be like CIBS, okay? Look at the logo, right? Uh, cooperation, that's the Chinese word, uh, meaning you know, cooperation uh, uh, between uh, uh, people from uh, different uh, uh, words, right? I think that is a great uh, note uh, for for con conclude uh, the 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 discussion, the bilateral discussion between. Uh, uh, but now we go uh, multilateral. And uh, any question from the floor? Yeah, please give to. Yeah. Hello. Oh, hello, Professor. Um, I think uh, I'm I'm Zhe Jun. I am a graduate of Fudan University. I think globalization is a very profound topic. On one hand, if it, it were not for a globalize, globalization, we probably wouldn't have iPhone or internet. But on the other hand, it's like um, globalization is kind of like, a, and we, uh, all of our friends, we um, split the task, split the chores and combine our efforts. But in the process, not everybody benefits the same, right? For example, some people are more capable than others. Some people work longer hours and uh, in the process, in the end, not everybody gets the same. So my question is that, uh, um, is it is it totally crazy to just let, let go the um, concept of globalization? We just totally forget it and make friends and as we wish and pr promote the concept of uh, fair competition and uh, um, helping those in need, right? That's my question. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. As you said, and as I said, and as uh, well, your colleague uh, said, globalization, international division of labor, opening international exchange, has a good side that it creates efficiencies. It has a bad side is that it hurts some of the people who produce. The solution, in my view, is not to turn back to globalization. We will, uh, there will be many more losers than the one that will stop losing <laughs> from globalization. Huh? I've often said that globalization is efficient and painful. Deglobalization will be inefficient and painful. That's that's what I believe. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that in some constituencies, the losers are not taken care of. And I mean, I'm a social democrat. Huh? I belong to the school of thought that was taught by the Industrial Revolution in the end of the 19th century, and that uh, if there are too many victims of these huge changes, they revolt, which they did. And as a consequence of that, Mr. Bismarck, who did not like uh, to be hung uh, on the street lamp, or Mr. Beveridge, or Mr. Ford, uh, or others, thought that reducing social insecurity through proper social policies was the way to go. And I still believe this is the way to go. And if I look at the correlation between are you in favor of opening trade or not? And do you believe your social system is good or not? There is a major correlation. So the issue is not turning back to globalization. 
the issue is reducing social insecurity. And there are many ways to do that. You can pay people for, if they are unemployed, you can pay for their retraining. You can put a lot of money in your education system so that kids are educated in disciplines which will matter 20 years from now instead of 20 years from now. There are lots of ways to do that. It's not a single recipe, but it's about taking into consideration the normal fact that if people are damaged, unhappy, they will they will scream and there will be political problems. And and I mean, I belong to a school of thought to believe that this is the way to go because at the end of the day, growing your economy has to grow your welfare and growing your welfare has to reduce the unhappiness of people. Some would say increase the happiness, others would say decrease the unhappiness. But I mean, philosophically, I think this is, this is the way to go. So at the end of the day, the happiness of people is the right thermometer. Now, the, there are a few discussions on how, who holds the thermometer. <laughs> I agree. And there are a few discussions on do we have the same measurement of the temperature? Uh, but that's, that's my view of the answer. We have a, a lady in the last law. Uh, she has been uh, raising the hand for long. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Lamy and Professor Xu. I'm a CIBS uh, EMBA alumni. Uh, Professor Lamy, you mentioned that in globalization, regulation is more important than tariff. So now due to all these uh, recent uh, protective regulation issued uh, you know, by U.S. government and in EU, now many Chinese companies actually, they are kind of forced to go abroad. They need to build factories in Mexico, for, and uh, sometimes they need to invest in uh, Eastern Europe to build factories too. Uh, so can I ask that uh, what is your recommendation for these Chinese companies that they are going abroad under the current uh, uh, geopolitical environment? Because, for example, you, you probably know the uh, CATL and Ford case. I think they face many difficulties abroad as well. Thank you. Well, this, this is back to what I try to, the distinction I'm trying to make between precautionism and protectionism. What the U.S. have done with IRA is largely protectionist. For instance, if they condition the allocation of a subsidy to a U.S. local content requirement, this is protectionist. And by the way, this is totally contrary to WTO rules. So the question is, why did nobody take uh, the U.S. to the WTO? There are reasons for that, not least the fact that the U.S. have a stolen the key of the dispute settlement. So if you stole the if you stole the key of the police station, you can rob the bank. Okay. Easier. Now this is protectionist, but if the EU put a, co a carbon border adjustment, this is not protectionist. This is not to protect EU producers from foreign competition is to align the carbon pricing between an EU producer and a foreign producer. And if we don't do that, we incentivize carbon leakages. So we put the price of carbon, but instead of limiting carbon emissions, we are incentivized carbon emissions because we push people to go and produce abroad. So this is absurd. And the reason why you put a price on carbon is not because we want to shoot in our own foot. The reason why we put a price on carbon is because we believe that's the right way to decarbonize our production system. So this is precautionism. It's not protectionism. And as far as Chinese uh, exporters uh, or investors uh, should behave, I think 
they have to recognize that precautionism is on the rise, and they will have to adjust to this sort of standard. And by the way, that some time ahead, China will do the same. China is a serious country about about cleaning the environment and fixing climate change. <laughs> and because I mean, China knows this sort of problem. So maybe EU is a bit ahead of the curve. But I mean, Chinese uh, investors, uh, if they invest in a facility that matches what we believe will be future environmental standards, will will do a good bet, in my view. Now, it's different if it's about protectionism and if you cannot sell a product in the U.S. without producing it in the U.S., then, of course, you have to move and invest in the U.S. But this is protectionism. And by the way, the WTO should be the place uh, where these uh, differences uh, are discussed and, if necessary, litigated as per the 1994 WTO charters, which has been signed by all the members of WTO, who have recognized that we have a dispute settlement which is binding. If the US don't want a binding dispute settlement, if they want to go back to their 1994 signature, it's a different ball game. It's not just an adjustment. Then they decide to step out of the system. Well, that's a big thing to do. Actually, I'm looking for a non-Chinese face. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank CEIBS for hosting this talk and Professor Lamy for coming. Um, as I've just said, I'm a British diplomat. My name's Sophie, um, and I work for the British Consulate in Shanghai, and I'm responsible for all things economic. Um, I just wanted to ask a bit about globalization and the digital trade. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your speech about globalization. Historically, technology has is interconnected and it still continues to be. And then you mentioned a bit about ideologies where it's slightly different now. But I'd be interested to, to hear what you think of digital trade, which you've briefly mentioned on, and the fact that now China is concentrating on that as the growth driver for the economy? And what do you think that will do to globalization in the world? Thank you. No, I mean, I think uh, digital trade is the way to go. <laughs> no doubt about that. Trade is digitalizing uh, domestically, internationally. The question, again, is the regulation of digital trade in so far as domestic regulations may differ and as a consequence hamper the facilitation, the diffusion of digital trade. And this is why there is a negotiation in WTO, which started uh, what, eight or nine years ago, which is trying to address a series of technical issues which have to do uh, with uh, digital trade, like, for instance, electronic signatures. Huh? You need electronic signatures. You don't do that on paper. What is the definition of an electronic signature? When is it recognized as valid? What is the sort of test of validity? Horribly technical. This is being discussed in the WTO, and there is, there is already on the table a package of measures of this kind, which I would advise to pocket, adopt, in order to do step one, and then maybe step two, and maybe step three. Now, for the moment, the discussion in the WTO is that some members, oh, yeah, but step one is not much. We should do step two and, and, and not adopt step one. Because if we adopt step one, then some of you won't want to go to step two. So let's go to step two directly. I don't agree with this way of doing. 
I think if the WTO clinches an agreement on digital trade, even if it is on step one, which is lower than step two, they should do it for a variety of reasons. So this is the way to go. But it is exactly what we were discussing. It's more complex to agree on the definition of what is a proper electronic signature than to reduce a tariff by two, three, or four percent. And, and again, it's not right. electronic signature should not be a philosophical discussion like on AI, for instance. So I think this this is the way to go. There is a place, the mission of which is to facilitate trade. It should keep facilitating, including digital trade, and move into the direction. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, in China, as uh, Professor Rami earlier said, you know, uh, the Chinese uh, work ethics uh, is uh, overwhelming, and uh, but uh, we do not want to apply uh, it uh, to Professor Rami and myself. Okay, so I will have to conclude. I know there are many uh, interesting questions, but uh, you know, the human brain, uh, you know, uh, work. Uh, this 100% uh, intensity and uh, need some rest, okay? So let me uh, thank our speaker, uh, Professor Rami, again, and uh, thank uh, uh, President Wang and uh, Dean uh, Frank, uh, and especially those of you who, who come all the way uh, to CIBS, and uh, uh, it's great that uh, we have a packed auditorium, and it's great that we can have this intellectual, you know, exchange, uh, you know, in this school. And uh, as Professor Rami was have been saying, right, we need to really uh, move uh, towards the positive side. Uh, and uh, even if uh, with a lot of difficulties ahead of us, we need to find a way, you know, uh, to 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 solve it uh, towards the future. Again, let's give a round of applause to Professor Rami.